Hey team, welcome to Inside the Movie Photographer with Jason Boland. Today, I've got uh, another special treat. I've got a friend of mine who's a photographer that lives in New Zealand and the UK. She's also kind of my boss. We worked together on a film just recently, uh, the new James Bond film, No Time to Die. I shoot the second unit, which is the action, and Nicola is the one that's responsible for all those incredible shots of Daniel Craig and everything else. Now, she's born in New Zealand, um, based in uh, New Zealand and the UK, and has worked with some of the most massive directors and actors you've ever met, including, like I said, James Bond, No Time to Die. Um, other credits include Murder on the Orient Express, Artemis Fowl, The Inbetweeners, Death of Stalin, and so many more movies that you've seen. Now, Nicola started her career traveling around the world, working for um, aid organizations and charities, um, bringing you those, those heart-wrenching images and um, that just blow you away. And then she moved into film stills and portraits. So um, I'm gonna bring in Nicola. She's just started up a academy of film stills so that you guys can learn how to be a film still photographer like Nicola and like me. And we're gonna talk about that later. So I'm gonna bring in Nicola now. And uh, hi Chan, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very well, how are you? I'm really good. Um, are you, because are you, you're my boss. I, I, um, <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. I was, I was pretty happy to be, you know, have our paths crossed for a week. We managed to uh, be on the same set up in Scotland for in the Highlands for about five days, which is very rare. So it seemed to me to be a too, too good an opportunity to miss, especially to meet the infamous Jason Boland. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, for for um, his behaviour away from set, more like it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, it is very rare. And Bond is the only film that I really do second in on, but I really love it because I just get to play with camera rigs yeah. and set stuff up. But, you know, the, the work that, I've, that I saw coming out of, uh, of that film of yours just blew me away, including one image in particular that is probably the best James Bond shot ever, which we're going to get to later. And we're also going to have a wow. chat about your, um, your academy, your film academy, film still academy, right? Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, I've had this idea floating around in my head for quite a while. And, you know, probably like you and like a lot of our colleagues, we get asked a lot about how do I get started and how did you get started? And I just thought, you know, there's, you can learn all, you can learn any kind of photography at various colleges, but except film stills photography. So it seemed like a, a really good opportunity now to try and, um, yeah, set something up and just give people a bit of a baseline, you know, for how to be on set, some do's and don'ts and some technical stuff. Of course, you, they've still got to, you know, make those calls and get on set and do the time and all of that. But it's uh, hopefully give them a little kickstart. Yeah. Well, hey, let's um, let's hook into some photos and we can we'll have a little bit of a chat yeah. about that further down the track because it really interests me. And a lot of the time, the people teaching film stills don't have the experience of someone who's yourself. So I think it's a real great opportunity to to join up for the for it. So Nicola, let's um let's hook straight into some photos. Photos and um, I want to start with some of your personal work because it blows me away and there's um, there's sure. a technique to it which I find very exciting. I mean, wow. Hey, so this is a series that you've done on religions, right? Mm -hmm. It's called Observance and I shot it on my 4x5 camera, you know, on the old-fashioned uh, film, sheets of film with the old black hood over your head oh really and um yeah yeah and they're long exposures they're all 15 seconds long and so i shot it with a mixture of ambient light and flash what i was interested in was how it was actually just after the bombings in london and lots of stuff it was oh. quite a long time ago like um 12 12 years ago and i was just interested in photographing people from different Different religions and different parts of the world, each in the very in the same way, and I wanted them to sort of hold to be in a state of prayer almost to be 
holding in mind their mantra or prayer or song or whatever. And I did sound recordings of them of that as well. And so for the exhibition, oh, wow. there was a whole sort of um, surround sound um, layered all over top of it as well. But what I was interested in is that actually, you know, underneath it all, the intention is the same no matter what religion you're from. You know, I was looking for the commonality amongst people. Yeah, looking at them um, earlier, I'm, I'll try not to um, go through it uh, too much because I want to be excited. About, I love that. I'll be excited about the images. Mm. And you can't really 100% pick what religion each person's from. And I, th and I think that maybe was what you're doing. Well, for me, it was uh, the, the feeling that I got was, that it's all just one person. It doesn't matter what is your um, is your belief. Yeah. It's it's we've got the same colour blood, right? Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's what I was trying to allude to, and to try and do that in a way that just use images. And I, and I was also really interested in how a picture portrays a sort of energy, you know, a vibe between what you feel off a picture more than just what you see. And yeah, it was really fascinating time. I was lucky enough to go to Japan and just where I did the bulk of the pictures actually, where there was an interfaith uh, conference that only happens once every five years. And I was able to go there and set up a studio and invite people to be photographed. And people, all the uh, religious leaders from around the world were there. So it was, it was an amazing experience. Oh, that's rad. Hey, which was, what religion, talk us through the religions. What, what was her religion? So she's a Buddhist. She lives. She's from East London. Her name's Teresa. Right. I can see the um, um, the uh, the necklace. Yeah. Yeah. So and uh, she's from Iraq and she's Muslim. That's a beautiful photograph. And she is a Sikh. Yeah. Oh really? She's a Sikh. She's from London, I believe. Yeah. She was beautiful. Oh, that's so cool. Where did you have the exhibition? Because. I have a feeling this is um, fam familiar to me. Oh, right. Yeah, well, it was exhibited in um, Southwark in a big church down there, uh, and it was like an abandoned church. It's called um, Dilston Grove. It's in a big park down in Southwark. And so they were all inside the ch this big, huge, having a church, which was very dark. They were exhibited in different ways in different gallery spaces. So Wilson Grove, they were actually backlit transparencies. So they looked like glass windows against the dark concrete wall. So yeah, it was, and then with bound going, it was, it was moving. And uh, everything that I hoped for, actually, and everything that I imagined it would be. And then it traveled to other places. So it exhibited here in New Zealand and um, in Europe and Japan. But they were big prints. It's, uh, it sounds stellar. I would love to, um, you have to flick me the soundtrack so I can have a listen to it one day. Because um, I can just imagine walking into yeah. this church and I with those, you know, the, like the, the transparency would have been kind of like stained glass windows in a way, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It was lovely. I've got a slideshow actually where they play. Uh, I'll send it to you, and they play for fifteen seconds, and then then lay over um, into the next one, and the soundscape lays over that. So I'll send you that. Oh yeah, I can't wait to see that. That would be awesome. Oh, this is so fifteen seconds, right? Were they all the exact same exposure? Yeah, they were all the exact same exposure. I spent a long time researching and devising my process and then, you know, lots of trial and error. And once I had that down, then I did the same thing for everyone. So it was 15 seconds. You know, you need a dark room. And I just used the modelling light from the one light, was the, was the 15 second exposure modelling light, and then a little pop of flash at the end. And it just gives, uh, catches the highlight in the eye. but. But if you see the big prints, I mean, they're like a metre and a half high. And they're sort of like paintings because they've got that um, slight movement in them. Yeah, yeah, and some oil to them. That's um, th th this, this is an extraordinary image too. I, I, what a great idea. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea of why did you want to shoot it at such a slow shutter and because you wanted to try and capture what the thought pattern was behind the eyes? You are saying before that you wanted them in prayer? Yeah, so it was sort of a process of, I was looking for a long-term project that I could do and I knew I wanted it to do something to do with faith and different cultures and different religions. Do you know, I, I can't quite remember what 
how I got to the long exposures. Sometimes things happen by accident and you happen to be in a dark room and you have to use a long exposure and you come out of that and go, wow, that was, I really like that actually. And let's, let's turn that and make use of that. And I liked, and it also harked back to early photography where um, long, they had to use long exposures. And that was when they thought that, you know, they believed that photography could capture your soul, you know, and um, so I, I was really interested in that aspect to it as well. That's really cool, actually. And we all know that you've got such a big heart and I think it's just such a beautiful, um, beautiful idea for an exhibition to pull people together and, and obviously you're going to get people from differing religions coming to the exhibition and maybe looking into the eyes of someone else um, makes them realise that, makes us all realise that, you know, we all are the same. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I got some funding for it, for it to tour around. And as a part of that, they, um, we put on some kind of, you know, interfaith um, meetings and talks and things where people could come together and experience the work together and you know meet each other so so that was there was a kind of an education aspect to it as well which was really nice this is one of the Japanese ones right I believe he's the a Shinto master which is a really specific Japanese religion yeah that's beautiful too uh, I, I keep flicking back because I um to my I normally have two screens but I'm away at the moment working so uh I don't have one and so I have to keep flicking back so I can see it full screen. So Nicola, I, I just really love this series and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the video that you send me of it so I can have a closer look and maybe if it's online we can put a link to it in the comments down below if it's on your website or something like that. Yeah. That'd be so cool. So this is another project of yours, right, Facade, which is I guess the juxtaposition between uh, the film industry reality and what we see on the big screen, right? Yes, it is. I've, I've always been fascinated by being on set. I love being on set, as you do too, I'm sure. And it's such an interesting place to be because there's all the crew are there and the actors are there and we turn up and it's all real and there's cameras and cables and like but everything we're there to do is to make to make something make believe those two worlds were always interesting to me and i think the actors they have to inhabit one foot in each of those worlds more than any of us any, anyone else on set and so i was always and I, I'm, I'm fascinated by actors processes and how they manage to exist in that world you know they've got to hit their mark they've got to be aware of the lights they've got to remember their lines but at the same time they're embodying this whole inner world that's their 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 tool is their you know their inner world and their emotions and the energy that they give across so it's i just was always on the lookout for pictures that those two worlds sort of were alluded to i guess and and the actors in a process and and sometimes pictures that actually shielded the actor's face so that you know to just kind of allude to the idea of them going inward because that's a is that a it's a floppy or a cutter in front of them and then you got the studio lights there as well it's like it's so cool yeah i absolutely love it so there's a whole series of those on my website oh awesome i gotta have a have a look i love it it's like um you know it's just underneath his nose it's just it's rad Hey, um, we're going to hook into some more film stills now. Look, I mean, that is just... See, that, that takes a special, special trust for actors to allow you into their space for scenes like this. Well, this is interesting because this is actually from my very first feature film. It's a film by Sally Potter called Yes, and that's Joan Allen and Simon Abkarian. And, you know... That my you know, I don't know about your first feature, but I was terrified most days and just terrified of missing something and terrified of, of not getting a shot. And, um, you know, Sally Potter is a very avant-garde filmmaker and on her previous film, she had used a Magnum photographer and she hadn't really been very happy with, you know, the kind of the level of work that he'd done. So... You know, not much pressure, not much uh, <laughs> uh, to live up to, but um, it was 
yeah, I was so excited to to be on set. I just was everywhere as much as I could be. And what was interesting about this particular moment was that on paper, it just looked like it read, you know, two actors just walk into the front door. There was no dialogue. And, you know, nor, sometimes you might think, oh, that's quite a good time to just go and get a cup of tea. And because I was feeling so anxious most of the time, I just would not let myself miss anything. So I stood myself on the back of a sofa against a wall and um, tried to get an angle and amongst all the crew. And this scene evolved and I got the shot. And just before the pictures were delivered, I got asked by the distribution company. They, they actually emailed me and said, did you happen to get that shot when they walk in the door and they're starting to kiss and there's that moment where she just turns her head and he kisses on the side. And I was able to say, yeah, I did. Did they use that as the one sheet? They used it as the poster. That is absolutely rad. And um, it's such a passionate image. And Jane Allen, I've worked with her a couple of times and she's uh, she's so much fun and an amazing artist. And you can just see it well done. Hey, you know, I'm still terrified when I'm on set. <laughs> yeah, well, she was, what a treat to get to photograph her for your first feature. She really looked after me and um, you know, she was so gracious and generous and, you know, and I tried to be empathetic to what to whatever scene she was doing as well. So, yeah, it, it was a wonderful experience to work with her. Yeah, lucky. Oh, I love this shot. It's, it's, I love film stills with movement through them. Oh. So what project's this? This is my very first film, short film, that I ever went on so this is from a film called rose's last train and um we one of the scenes was underground and like on the underground so you know and again it was just you know she's waiting for a train you sort of think well how exciting is that going to be I, I knew that if i could get some movement in there it would just add a bit more make it a bit more dynamic and you know this is back in the day when you're shooting on slide film you know so you don't know if what you're getting is working or not so you know, every time a train came, I, you know, I did lots where it was all sharp and I just did a few at the end where I thought, okay, let's try this. And, you know, you're holding your breath and it stinks down there. So you're holding your breath for two reasons <laughs> to try and not shake the camera as well. Yeah, I was lucky enough to get a shot and they used that for their little um, publicity for their, you know, the short film. That's so cool. Hey, um, what film did you used to shoot on back in the day? Uh, slide film, I seem to, oh, gosh, it was so long. I mean, I remember fighting to step out of slide film and shoot on colour neg film, you know, and the, a lot of the production companies and studios were really against that because they all wanted, they all had to deliver and slide. Um, and I used to sort of campaign to try and shoot on colour neg just to give ourselves a bit more leeway. There was a bit more leeway for exposure on colour neg. I seem to remember shooting on Provia. Yeah, I was never, I was never too much of a kind of perfectionist when it came to film stock and things like that. I'll use whatever you give me. <laughs> yeah, I was a, I was an EPJ three twenty EPJ guy, and I, I found it the same. It was like because I used to have to shoot yeah. sixty percent transparency and forty percent black and white, and it's just like just let us shoot negative, and then you can turn it into black and white so yeah. easy. And it was just did my head in in those days. I know. I think back now, and I think, wow, how did we, how did we, how did we do that? Uh, yeah, I know. It's like, especially with you know how our lives have changed now, shooting digital. I'm really glad I got to train though and learn on film and slide, where you had to be very particular about what you're doing. You had to know exactly what you're doing, and you had to, you had a quota. I, you know, you used to have a quota for film stock for the day you had to be very mindful as to when you were pushing the button yeah that's really true it's um i can't remember what it was I used, oh gosh i used to go through so much film and it was great fun though wasn't it, it was like you know how fast you could load it and then putting the cap back on the on the plastic waste which oh my gosh and then like you throw them in the bin from 30 yards away <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's aspects of um, of film shooting on film that I miss, like handing over your, you know, I seem to remember between six and ten rolls a day of 36. You know, that's not a lot of shots per day by what we shoot now. 
um, would be the the sort of quota. So I'd hand those over to the rushes runner, and a few days later, uh, lovely contact sheets would turn up. So you know, I miss that because now we're the lab, right? Yeah, I do all my work on set though. It's like don't bring anything home anymore. It's um, you can you, you can see. I think that the film days we were kind of forced to be on set constantly because you we weren't getting that instant gratification of knowing that you know we had the shot especially you know in a dialogue scene you know you can do a couple of takes and get out and you know action's a different story as you know but you know you, you can get get your stuff and then concentrate on some beautiful behind the scenes which brings us into into this and I, I love behind the scenes shots I mean for on a film set for me they're my landscapes and talk me through it yeah this shot again was from Sally Potter's film that I did that's my you know, first feature. And yeah, I, I mean, my background is in documentary photography as well, where the training was that you anticipate what might come next and you place yourself, you keep looking for, you know, patterns and um, you place yourself and, and anticipate what might, what might happen. And so I seem to remember that it was, um, this is the, the the chap in the middle with the one eye blinking. That's Alexei Rodionov, who's this um, crazy Russian uh, director of photography. And he just put up so many flags and bounce boards. Um, his lighting was extremely beautiful. And you know, it, you and that's quite an, an interesting interesting shot as as it is. You know, with with him there and Joan Allen uh, being standing in being lit but then sally came in and then the guy put his hand in and you sort of you know those moments where more elements come in to more perfect uh magic yeah i, lo I love all those elements you know the, as you're saying the hand and the, and the um the old reflectors and you know the negative um well it's not really negative feel it's like it's negative cut on the over the top it's um i can just imagine i'd, I'd like to see the shot from the other side too actually yeah. it's um it's glorious oh talking of glorious come on that's just like beautiful uh, <laughs> yeah that was a lovely a lovely film to work on this is venus by the director roger michelle and of course, this is Peter O'Toole. And this is the moment where I got them to redo um, their little dance for me once all the crew had piled out of the of the church. Yeah, it, simplicity is sometimes the best as well when you're just going for that really simple moment, really simple composition, simple lighting. That was such a treat. They look like such dear friends. Yeah, yes. Well, they play the, they, that's their role in the film is that way and then... And there was actually three of them. There was another another gentleman too. They were so fun to work with. They were always having a laugh. And Peter O'Toole, come on. That's got to be a treat. I know. He was um, charming, very charming, and just a real gentleman, wonderful. So this would have been one of your last of the film days, right? Yeah, I think so. I'd have to go and have a look at the chronological order of all of that and when... Um, the films get a bit mixed up in your memory, but it was probably really near that cusp, yeah, I would say. If, you, if you're anything like me, I remember the, um, the films of, like, you know, when my kid's born and, uh, you know, just, just random things, random yeah. th events like that. <laughs> Look at the yeah. light on that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What film was this from? Well, this is from Venus as well, and there was this sort of crazy, uh, it wasn't a flashback, but... Um, there was a little segment where they were in period costume. The film was a modern film, but yeah, there was just this couple of days. And that's Andrea Riseborough before she became Andrea Riseborough that we know today in many ways. And she was just playing a very tiny role. And that's natural light, that's window light uh, coming in just um, to her right, just ahead of her. And yeah, she was talking to someone, just standing there talking to someone, and I, you know, I stopped and took some pictures. Um, I think I took some initially with the with window in, and then just tighter and got shots without the window. And yeah, I've loved that picture. It's never been used or never, you know, been seen anywhere. But I've actually had it printed, and and it's on my wall. I really love it. Yeah, it's those moments which, you know, we're so lucky to have these amazing directors of photography that give us so much of our light, but. They're, they're 
boxed in where they can only use that part of the light, whereas we can go hunting and and searching and find these other little pockets which aren't in the movie which just look beautiful. And, you know, with the guys that I know, they when they see it, they're just like, oh, I know, I love it, but you just, you know, they can't. They can't use it, and this is a classic example of that. Yeah, this is uh, the DOP on on all Rogers Roger Michelle's films has been um, a fantastic DOP called Harris Sambalokas, and I've worked with him a number of times. And yeah, his lighting is always quite extraordinary. You do these beautiful projects. Oh, I, I love this. This is so groovy. <laughs> Yeah, this is Brideshead Revisited. Um, so this would have been, yeah, 2007 maybe, 2008. And, yeah, this, this was a big film for me to get at the time, actually. This was a, you know, a, I know that uh, the producer, Kevin Loder, who I had done a couple of smaller films with, he wanted me to do it and... You know, he pushed for me to get it, and I know that he had some pushback because I probably, they probably could have easily got someone, you know, a bigger name. And uh, I've always been incredibly grateful to him. You need people to fight your corner sometimes, don't you? And again, yeah. so, you know, I just worked so hard on that film to make sure I covered everything, and the lighting was beautiful. And I mean, you know, it's bright to be visited, and the costumes and the locations and uh, I loved it. It was heaven. So this was your, your big break into Hollywood, was it? Yeah, I would say. I seem to remember when I um, I went to see Kev down in Soho at the office and he told me that they'd finally agreed. Uh, I seem to remember buying a bottle of champagne on the way home. So that by the time I got home, my my, uh, my now husband and I cracked it open. So I think it must have been, it must have been, it felt at the time like a big break. Oh, I love it. Yeah, so that's a common question that I'm always getting to ask when I do these uh, interviews. What's your big break and what is your advice to the aspiring photographers out there that, you know, want to hook their teeth into the film industry? Yeah, my advice is often uh, kind of similar, which is that, you know, you need to have patience and you need to have persistence. So, you know, you're not going to sort of step on into um, a bigger film straight off the bat. So, you know, get on short films, um, get some days on set under your belt. You know, you've got, it's a bit like learning to fly, isn't it? You've got to get those hours under your belt. Yeah. And so you've just got to keep at it. I mean, I think there are times where, um, you know, where I sort of thought, ah, oh, you know, is it is it worth it hanging in there? But it, it really is if you just... Uh, you know, keep keep going and um, you know, making those good networks, building a portfolio. I know it sounds weird because it's so cliche, but it really is about believing in yourself. I think you know, and and you, you know, you hit it on the head there of not giving up. And you know, I always mm -hmm. say to people that you know, you can be the photographer you dream to be, but there's no shortcuts. Exactly what you were saying. It's like you know, it's learning the fly is actually the best analogy I've ever. Uh, I've ever heard of it. So very good advice, right? This uh, Now, this next shot, I know there's a good story to this. And um, how was the great Bill Murray to work with? He, he, <laughs> he kind of liked you, didn't he? Well, we had, yeah, we had a good time on set. He's um, He was great fun to have around. He'd bring his music in and he'd get the, the crew to bring in their favourite um, CDs. I mean, I think he's... He still got my favourite CD of Fat Freddy's Drop, and I'm very happy about that. I don't mind sacrificing that for Bill Murray. And so, the, yeah, the story behind this is that we had been shooting. Uh, this is this film is Hyde Park on Hudson, and he is playing um, FDR, another film by Roger Michelle. And we had been filming up in the forests in um, in England. And the only day we could shoot all the gallery stuff was this particular day we were in the forest. So I had to truck out, out lots of uh, battery lights and um, a couple of assistants and set up two different backdrops and all in the forest. Um, and I love that stuff. I love, you know, having to work around all those elements. I think you need to have that as a stills photographer because things never quite, you know, go the way that you think they might. 
Uh, and we'd actually done the shots with him. He'd come and gone and come and gone a couple of times because we had um, a few different looks we were trying to achieve. And I had said to him, could we just get one more <laughs> famous phrase, just more, um, if you just step off the backdrop and I'll just get you with this lovely path behind in the trees. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And I only shot, um, and, and one of my assistants came running over with the light and I only shot five or six frames. This was, uh, it might have, that might have even been on my large, on my medium format camera, I'm, I think. I said, thank you so much, I'm done and that's great. And he said, he said, come on, I've got an idea. And he started to put his cane, hook his cane around his neck and start pulling himself away and up and he said come on take the shot take the shot <laughs> so i think i just dumped my other camera and picked up a smaller one and went in and just shot him doing his crazy thing and then you know it's just like a minute a minute and a half you know done and he you know gives puts his arm around you and say well done and then he's back off the set and it was just such a treat how rare is it that an actor actually asks you to take more pictures <laughs> like never, or, or the, the, that one time. Um, this is an extraordinary shot too. I mean, it's. I think it's, for me, I mean, I'm a big Bill Murray fan and um, it's possibly uh, the best portrait of him that I've seen. You know, I mean, certainly is for me. I, I love everything about it. And, and then to have that story that you were shooting on the background and then just, hey, Bill, come on, let's just do some in the, in the forest. Um, it's so cool because, I mean, people don't get to see that. You yeah. think that that's the shot and to actually have it, um, you know, this big setup in the middle of the forest when there's this beautiful background uh, is just, it's just insane. And, and, and anyone that's, um, that's interested, the, the shots that Nicola was just talking about then are on her Instagram, which you all should be following her by now anyway, uh, I saw them the other day. <laughs> that, was so, that was hilarious. It was on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they've been set in my archive for all these years you know 10 years and I've sort of never you know thought twice about them but because of the you know things that I'm putting together for the Film Sills Academy I was just going through it's really great going through and reliving some of these wonderful moments that when you're busy and on films and you shoot so much every day it's kind of like a fast moving train isn't it and and then you're on to the next thing and the next thing. And then when I wasn't working, I had two small kids. So it's really nice now to take a breather and to stop and have the time to go through a lot of my archive and pull some of this stuff out because it's never been seen before. This picture, this portrait of Bill was never used by the um, production company, you know, so. Wow, that's that's incredible. And, you know, I agree with you 100% about the back catalogue. It's You need to make time to go back through it because you I find that I haven't changed the way I shoot, but I've changed the way, I've changed what I like about what I shoot. So I'll go through, you know, old matrix images and stuff like that. And images that I just weren't interested in at that stage of my photography, now I look at them as like, wow, it's, it's more relevant to how I work now. And I just didn't realize it. Yeah, I agree. And I think editing is a massive part of being a photographer. And that's how you can shoot the same series of pictures and the pictures you choose to show now might be very different than the ones you chose to highlight 10 years ago, even though it's the same you know, series of images. And I, I think that's one of the things that I'm really interested in working with younger photographers on is, is learning how to edit their work well and learning how to um, understand what kind of photographer they are and what their strengths are and then how to build a portfolio as a whole that tells a story instead of just sort of um you know one-off pictures that are not relevant to each other or you know all that all that stuff but i i love editing and i think it's a really underrated skill amongst photographers it's quite hard edit you sometimes yeah i um i do an edit select every day and i'm finding you know i have done for mm, the last 15 years 10 or 15 years and i find that not only um, gives me a little bit of peace of mind, but it's also helping the the photo department. Um, you know, they've got other images that they need, but if they can take what we've done and, you know, we've got rid of some gear or, you know, put in a radial or whatever, um, you know, it, it makes life easier for them as well. And I think it's, in, 
important part. And I, I'm really, I want to come and do your your, um, your Stills Academy and learn a few things because it's. Uh, I think that I think there's going to be a lot for people to learn there. A lot of the younger photographers will complain about having to edit their own work, and it's like, you know, because it's oh, it's overtime, and it's like, well, yeah, it might be, but you know, you're going to get hired again. So what do you want? <laughs> Yeah, and it's a really important part of understanding what you have done that day and the mistakes you might have made and how you can do better tomorrow. Good point. What you've, um, you know, the, the images that you, uh, maybe you could have picked up a different angle or something like that. And I think it's really valuable. Uh, it's, my hat's yeah. off to you. I mean, I do the stunt workshop, which is a lot of fun, but um, doing an academy, you know, fr from a, a real live working photographer uh, is going to be invaluable to to people it's a great industry you know i mean it's so much fun no, no day is the same it's all all different and you don't get a second chance at it so you have to be able to think on your feet to start with right oh very much so yeah and i used to be a documentary photographer as you mentioned and worked for charities but i also shot with a lot uh, in my early days and that was such great training for exactly what you've just mentioned which is you have to be technically fast and and proficient and you cannot muck it up and you've got to smile the whole time isn't that the truth hey um this is a beautiful beautiful image you know? what, what filter from i just love the shadows yeah, and the, so the that, light. yeah this is another sally potter film i've done three films with sally now so this was a, a film called ginger and rosa uh probably from about six or seven years ago you know i guess this picture for me to, you know I love storytelling within a picture, and if I can do that within one picture, then then even better. So I'm always looking for those moments that tell a bit of a story. Yeah, that that just happened to be be the moment that um, the mum's on the right when she just you know reached out to touch her um, elbow, and it yeah it, again it's it's that thing of being in the right place at the right time and just waiting for that extra element to to kick in yeah and i love it's you know i've i've just got the the big screen which i can flick onto and just the shadow from her little feet um just really you know the shadows from from the mum's feet as well and i mean it yeah. it really sets this whole image off it's just like how lucky were you to get those pockets of light because it's like they just happened, right? Yeah, and you know that's the thing is that you can you the, there's luck involved as well with the elements and weather and sun and shit, all of that. So yeah, you you, you just got to hope when those when it all comes together. And there are many times where it doesn't come together, and that's the thing, you know, the, where you know the clouds come across and it's not quite what you'd hoped it to be. But we we move on from those and try and focus on when it does. Clicker. Yeah, no, it's um, but you're exactly right. You gotta, you gotta make your own luck, and you gotta search for your own luck, and you know, you gotta see exactly that. You gotta see those little things like the, you know, the shadows of the feet and uh, off the swing, and you know, that's that's our job. Is you know exactly what you're saying. We're storytellers, and um, I mean, you're more of an artist than me. I don't look at myself as being an artist, but I do look at myself as being a, a storyteller, and. That's just a beautiful, beautiful frame. This is from Pride, right? Yeah, this was um, a, a crazy day on the London where they, we were there very early in the morning, so they shut the bridge off, and we had one chance for this whole crowd to walk across um, the bridge. And so, you know, as a photographer, they've got two or three different cameras in different places, and as a photographer, you can only be in one place at, at a time, right? So I could have either, you know, you're always weighing up where is the optimum position and are you going to tie yourself in a bit of a knot if you go there or what's going to... So I decided to just sort of get down and amongst it and um, just walk backwards with my camera and, you know, go for the expression and go for that, the, the faces. But I had to make sure I still had the, the context in, in place. So with the... Um, you know the buildings and and trying to get the signs in as well again you're trying to tell that story in one picture and yeah the, i shot a lot of frames and um the, quite a few worked but this was the this was the one yeah it's it's, it's a lot of um a lot of power in, in that image and and of course what people aren't seeing there is the film crew and everything else going on behind you and that you've got to stay out of frame so you know 
yeah. the job of a film film set photographer yeah. uh, is is a tricky one. And you know, we're not the first camera; we're the second, third, fourth, or fifth camera. And to pull off images like this is very tricky. And uh, my hat tip to you on that one. I love this shot. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's always so satisfying when you don't know. I think that's part of the thrill of it, isn't it, Jason? That's what's kind of addictive about this job is that every day you like, can I make it happen today? Can I make it happen today? You know, nothing's nothing's set in stone, and it's always a thrill when you when you sort of pull it off, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was a newspaper photographer stationed uh, through Asia and and London back in the late 80s. And, you know, I get the same adrenaline rush on a film set as what I used to do. You know, film sets are, film sets are a great environment for a photographer. I mean, it's exciting. And, you know, like we're saying is, you know, we've got to keep out of the way and shoot without being shot. And, you know, I treat it like I did in my old newspaper days, that the environment is real. I like to call it the director's performance. And that's all I'm interested in. I'm not, you know, I don't do so many setups. I like to capture what I just, you know, what I just said, you know, the director's performance. And um, this is a classic example of that. And, it's, you know, you can't set this up later. I mean, you know, the cuts called yeah. and the shoulders drop, the air expires. I love this shot. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, well, we had one chance at this. You know, the filmmakers only had one chance at it as well in terms of, you know, they'd, bridge was shut off, it was first thing in the morning and they had a big crowd that they had to get across the bridge and they had one shot at it. So they've, they've got two or three or four cameras on it and I decided to get down and get amongst it and um, yeah, you're, you know, I think as a stills photographer you have to be constantly your peripheral vision. You can't just be looking through the, the little black box of your viewfinder and thinking that that's all that matters. You've got to also be very aware of the two camera people on this side and the sound person on that side and the grips, you know, and all sorts of other things that, that you've got to be mindful of as well as thinking, right, I've got to try and get them all in frame and keep the building frame at the back. And it'd be great if I can see that that sign too because that helps with the storytelling so you know you're always balancing a lot of a lot of things and it's you know it's exciting when you have when you're up against it like that I like those days and you know you get that adrenaline buzz and you never know if it's gonna if you're gonna pull it off or not I mean you kind of you kind of hope that you'll get something um, and you always get something but you know you're always pushing for something more you know you're always pushing for that bit of magic right yeah, absolutely. Um, I shoot with both eyes open. I don't know whether you do, but I, I find yeah. that a lot of the time I'm I'm looking at what's going on around me as opposed to what I'm shooting, and then I'll then I'll have a quick glance to make sure that the framing's right, and then the rest of the time I'm just like you know yeah. checking out whether I'm whether I'm about to get run over and if I have to get out of the way. And oh, I've, been yeah. to, I've been known to throw myself on the floor at times when a steady cam swings around. And it's like Whoa. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You have to be very agile and you have to be willing to, you know, be, as you say, on the floor or, um, you know, and sometimes you get, you sort of get elbowed out the way if if that's what's required, if you haven't quite, if things have changed at the last minute and that, and we all understand that that's perfectly fine and getting the shot, you know, them getting their shot is the priority and what we do, we have to work in and around that and that's what I think some photographers struggle with you know you've got to accept that you're not the most important job on set in that moment despite the fact that our job is really important for all those months after when they're trying to sell the film yeah that's so true you know um crew relationships are very very important and yeah understanding um what everyone does on a film set and and you know where their eyes need to be focused and and stuff like that and i'm the same as what you are it's like i sit there and just say hey listen if I make you feel uncomfortable, you've got to let me know. Yeah. I'm fine with it. And nine times out of ten, everyone's always fine with you cozying up. But then also, you know, it's like, hey, just give me a little kick so that I know yeah. if if it's if it's not working for you. And I can, you know, I can move easily. But 
you know, like yourself, shooting with both eyes open, you, you're very aware of what's going on and, and, you know, that's really good advice too that, you, that you're giving there for everyone is be aware of your, your surroundings and your environment. Yeah, yeah, keep both eyes open is the good way to describe it for sure. Yeah, it's a great, uh, this is Stalin, right? Yeah, this is the death of Stalin. So I've done a couple of films now where there's a big ensemble cast and that's that's always a challenge when you've got to try and get lots of people in one frame and you know a two-hander well that's so so easy really compared to I mean I think on Murder on the Orient Express there was a cast of 16 you know top oh. uh, A-listers you know it's tough and so you're looking for, you're looking for those moments where you can get as many in as possible and um, yeah this was the moment the death of Stalin himself and um, again I just love the storytelling within this picture where you're looking for the moment of trying to describe the relationships between the different characters and the different cast and you know each one of these actors is so expressive and so funny they can be funny just by standing there doing nothing you know though it was yeah, it was like watching theatre every day unfold in front of you, and they could they could make you laugh just with a eyebrow, you know. That's a good point. Oh, what you're saying about watching live theatre—that's you know—I look at it the same way, and it's was so privileged. And sometimes you would just—I mean, I look through the frame, and I don't even take a photo. I just watch yeah. these amazing performances, and it's just like, oh my gosh, it's like if people, you know, to be able to do that. And this is an extraordinary frame too. I mean, I love it. You know, you've got the painting in the background. Yeah. I'm looking over the shoulder and, you know, it's just absolutely 100% tells the story of, of what you can't tell the story any more than what it already is. I love the yeah. guy under the carpet too. <laughs> What's that, sorry? I love it with, with his foot under the carpet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the little details that sometimes you don't notice when you're in, in the moment shooting that uh, afterwards when you're looking through, you can sort of, you know, pick up some of those details. But, yeah, I was very aware of that, of the uh, painting in the background and making sure that I sort of waited for, for him to come forward. I knew that that was when I could get that moment and you just got to hope that he's not blinking in that moment or... All sorts of other things. I mean, I seem to remember that we were creeping behind me as a wall, and um, the camera was on a dolly, a very slow track along the wall, and I was kind of creeping in front of the camera, trying to stay down low because there was a, a window light. So, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you know if I was kind of crawling along, but I seem to remember it being quite uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, but I just thought, no, I, you know, I'm so, so thankful to, to be there and that they were, you know, everyone was cool with me doing that and um, it really, it really worked. Yeah, it certainly did work. And that's, that's a really good tip to what you're saying. I think that with experience, you can wish those moments to happen and, and, you know, like you're saying, that move out of the way so that, you know, you get the painting in the background. It's, it's all about refining your work you know you can have all the greatest skills in the whole wide world but when it comes to being on a film set it's about refining that style and and making these moments happen as opposed to uh just not pushing to be in the right spot yeah that's right and i think that's what that persistence is you know you've got to persist in sort of getting back on set and and onto onto your short films or whatever but you know even when you're at the level that we're at you've got still got to be persistent because how easy is it when you've had maybe a bit of a rough morning and you just think oh I, uh, yeah I'm just going to take it easy this afternoon sometimes you know and you've got to push through that and go no it's you know I always think back to that moment where back on that first feature Sally's film where they walked in the door and that became the poster like that has driven me in the many years since because I think what if I miss that what if I miss that what if something happens <laughs> so it's a slight sense of paranoia I think that drives me I'm with you I get um you know some of my most recognized images have come from the last two or three minutes of the day yeah and you know it's easy to leave uh easy to leave early but you know like you know one of the shots from from um 
Fury Road from Mad Max with yes. Fury Osa screaming in the desert. I was walking yes. to my car and I'm I know like, the shot. Yep. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, hold on a minute here. And I was just going to have a look at it from this angle before turning it in for the day. It was the, you know, it was the last take of the day. And then it happened, you know. So you've got to be there. If you're not there, you're not going to get it. No, absolutely. That's right. And, you know, you just, you just always stay alert and on the lookout. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. come on. This is like this, <laughs> this portrait is one of the most glorious images I have ever seen. Oh, I haven't seen this you. film. My Cousin Rachel, yeah, that's another Roger Michelle film. Oh. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautifully lit film. How was she to work with? She was great. I mean, she's very um, committed to her role. So I know when we did the, um, you know, she comes she comes with ideas and she comes with thoughts and, um, you know, like all the good actors do. Uh, the gallery shoot for that was over the course of about three days and she came in on two, two separate days, which is really great of her to do that. Normally, you know, they'll kind of give you a slot and that's that. Um, but she was really happy to come back and because we were, we had quite a lot of uh, drawings and uh, concepts to shoot to and um, we had quite a few different lighting setups going. Um, so, so yeah, and but, you know, you have all the concepts in the world and this is the one where at the last, sort of towards the end, I just asked you to have the veil right in front of her face and... Um, yeah, I got run really close, um, and yeah, I was really stunned with it as well. Because quite often, you know, you shoot a lot of material, and uh, sometimes, sometimes what the production companies, the studios, or the marketing people, they have to sort of tone things down. And in this case, you know, I was just so thrilled that they actually went with something bold and simple and beautiful, and I thought it worked really well. In fact, that poster was. Um, uh, won some awards, I think, at the design thing in London. Oh, the PDA or whatever it is. The yeah. Meeting online yeah. and stuff, yeah. That's, um, oh, my gosh. And did you like this with strobe or, um, yeah. or constant? Yeah. it's I all shoot all my uh, poster shoots with strobe, yeah. Right. And um, it's just beautiful. It really, yeah. how, it doesn't look like you've got a lot of light. You haven't got a lot of lights there. Only a couple of lights, or yeah, I'm trying to think because we had two or three different lighting setups. Um, we were shooting with mirrors and reflections, and oh. um, uh, for some other you know concepts that they had. So I think this was where we were doing. It was just one big, really beautiful softbox, quite high, quite close, um, and then. Yeah, maybe a bit of bounce, but I try to keep things simple, really. Yeah, I do too. The last shoot that I did um, a couple of weeks ago, I think I had 18 heads, so that's keeping it really simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you've got to be sure, right? Oh, the, the concepts were just to do it. The way that I do it, like, is um, I'll just do it all on the one set and so I'll have the yeah. I'll have the. the two or three or I think I had on this one I had six different lighting concepts and then pulled it back to three but it was just a matter of turning lights on and off and, yeah. and yeah. changing the uh, intensity so um, yeah that can work it's well lot, it's it's a lot of fun if you get the right cooperation doing the doing the special shoots and and you know the payoff is <laughs> an image like this yeah I enjoy it I find it stressful in terms of the lead up and the planning and will you get them and how long will you get them but it's very rewarding when you do get them and you again you know you pull it off yeah yeah I was pleased and, and still trying to um do your day job at the same time yeah well exactly because you're running back to set in case you're missing something there and yeah it's a busy few days <laughs> yeah isn't it yeah it's crazy oh, see this is when I saw all these of yours I was just like oh damn these are these <laughs> these was when you um because you're a member of the society of motion picture still photographers yeah. as, as what i am and i remember that um when, when we were going through draft week and looking at your images i can't say too much because it gives away to gives away uh 
the magic and mystique, yeah. but um, everyone was blown away by by the work on this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that that was it was oh, a fantastic job, and again, one of those jobs where you had um, sixteen A listers on a train, right? Mm. So, you know, there's no room corridors. Um, yeah, so we and and directed by um, you know Ken Branner, who's also in the film, and so there's a lot of um, a lot of constraints going on there in terms of how, as a photographer, you know, you, the constraints that you need to work in, not just space, but, you know, being very mindful of um, of the, the Ken's need to um, be both the director and the actor. So um, there's – but, uh, yeah, he was fantastic to work with. And it, um, as long as you were, you know, bringing your A game, then he respected that and he gave me – um, you know, everything I needed whenever I, you know, asked for something, he was right there. And I always make sure that that's, if I ask for something, I it's, I really need it. It's not because of a whim, you know, um, you've got to pick your battles or, you know, pick your moment carefully and keep your powder dry for when you really need those, those moments. And um, yeah, well, this was one of them, obviously getting Poirot in the, in the carriageway of, of the train. And yeah, check out that tash. I know, right? It's a it's a classic. Um, I love this film too, and it was a it was a really cool film to watch. And I can't remember whether it was the first assistant director or someone else that worked on it with you. And this was only just recently they told me that um, you had to do a lot of your coverage. You were shooting through the windows of the carriage. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Sometimes we were they they built. The um, the Orient Express they built replicas of it, and they built them so that one side could come off, um, right. obviously, so that they could get you know platforms and cameras and things in there. But not always, and on other times, you know, we were on um, a normal sized train. So yeah, it was very much about. I think that was I had. Um, I think I, maybe it was the first time I had used a mirrorless camera and it totally saved my bacon for sure because I could, because they're much smaller and I could kind of hold, you know, and they, I could see this, the screen on the back so I could be much more unobtrusive. And if I couldn't get actually physically be in on the carriage, maybe I could just get a camera <laughs> through a gap somewhere, you know, and um, hope for the best. Uh, it's terrifying when you're, you know, when you feel like you're, you know, at the margins of what's possible physically and, you know, technically, and you're constantly pushing it all the time. So this was perhaps one of those instances where, you know, I knew at the beginning that I would have to step up a bit more often and, and ask for a moment here and there because because there would be, you know, not much space. Yeah. Yeah, exactly what you said about the mirrorless. I mean, it's revolutionised um, yeah. our life on a film set, you know, just being able to stuff a camera into places that you'd never yeah. been able to do it. And, you know, I used to lie on my stomach on the floor all the time and now um, now you don't have to do that. It's, yeah. And being able to change settings, how cool is that? To not be constrained by that the blimp, is it's like being sort of free, isn't it? It's being, you know, let loose. Um, it's a joy, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I love this. Oh, my gosh, this is a beautiful, beautiful shot. Was, was this a setup or was this part of the, your unit coverage? I think this was a setup. I definitely shot a lot of that scene as well. Oh, that's a great shot. And this yeah. one too. Oh, my gosh, that uh, is just like make my heart melt with. Do you like a veil? <laughs> I do like a veil. Yeah, I like a bit of mystery. <laughs> she was just standing waiting in the um she wasn't even, I think, you know, she was waiting in the little doorway of the carriage and I just walked past and, you know, the light was so beautiful and she was quite reflective and, yeah, got like three frames and then carried on walking. Yeah, at least, I mean, I haven't got all of the character posters here, but the, the character posters from this film um, are some of the most beautiful I've seen, you know. They're, they're mm, just, thank you. Just glorious and 
I know it sounds weird, but this is when you really smashed onto the radar for me with, with all these amazing images. <laughs> uh, and then we get onto this guy. Oh, my gosh, um, where we get to work together. Now, because it's not out, we can't say too much about it, but um, you can show the images that have been released and yes. we can say how much of a great time we had. And uh, he's a great Bond. Oh, yeah. I mean, what a privilege that was to get that chance to, to shoot on a Bond. It came as quite a surprise to me, I have to say, and I leapt at it, obviously. Um, and this shot was from the second or third day of filming when we were in Jamaica. We started filming there. We were there for two weeks, I believe. And so, you know, everybody was all still fresh and finding their way and sort of crew getting to know each other. And, um, yeah, and, again, you know, this is one of those things where he just walks into a room. There's no action. There's no no one else involved. He's walking through a room. Again, it's that skill of the director of photography with the lighting and making that moody and having the the different layers of light that are there. I was pretty lucky, I have to say, with the shot in the sense that he did this He did this walk across maybe four times, five times, and I saw from the first one, I saw what happened with the light um, when, he, when it hit his face and the shadow of the gun at the same time. So, um, you know, I really honed in on that moment when he came back again and again and again and sort of just, just shot for that moment, really, in that whole scene. And, um, yeah, it worked. Yeah, I'm, I'm like you. I pick moments from a scene. Yeah. I totally don't care about what's left or right. Yeah. Of it. Just wait till they get to that one part and then it's like, yeah, that's all. That's all I, that's absolutely all I wanted. Thank you very much. Look, I mean, yeah, you had your DP on this is just absolutely uh, wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that, that was, it was great. And that, this is, a, there's a little story about this as well and that, this is also in Jamaica, and it was obviously in a bar. It was very dark and extremely hot. People's gear was exploding and melting, and because of the way they were shooting it, there was I felt I couldn't find an angle, and there was nowhere to be. There was eye lines, and the the light wasn't right. And I think in between takes, I kind of plucked up some courage and dived under the bar and scooted through a door on the other side of the bar. So they're leaning on the bar there. Um, and sort of snuck in that doorway where the props guys were hiding out because they were coming out and sort of putting, refilling the glasses and whatnot. And I just thought, well, I mean, I've, I've, you know, you're always looking for that gap. You're always looking. It's a bit like needle in a haystack sometimes. And, again, I just put my frame up and... It was really silhouette and I put it down again. I thought, oh, you know, there's nothing there. And I put it up again. And just at that moment, the light at the back moved around because they're, they're swinging all around those sort of disco lights and it just went pop. And, yeah, right moment, right time. So, you know, that perseverance, again, pays off. You create your moments. And, you know, what we are just talking about before about picking nanoseconds from a scene yeah. Um, you know, they only use one frame from a scene. They're not going to use 10 photos. So no. it doesn't matter which one it is. It's the one that, that screams the loudest. That's right. And the one that, that represents that scene and the one that tells the story of that scene in the best moment. And you don't have to worry about the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. See, you and your portraits. Oh, <laughs> <come on. laughs> uh, long lens. Just... Long lens. You're a fan of the long lens. Yeah, I'm a fan. I'm a f Although I'm starting to do action um, with like 50s and stuff oh, like yeah. that. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm starting to get in there more copper style and right. tin page style. But, nice. um, but yeah, it's I love a long lens on a on a on a set, especially when there's smoke involved, and you know, because it yeah. just bleeds. The color just bleeds through the whole frame. Yeah, yeah, and the the sort of picks up does lovely things with all the little twinkly lights at the back. Again, you know, this is shooting right through the crew. You know, I'm not, it's not like, oh, you know, there's many things in front of me. It doesn't yeah. look like it when you're, when you see those shots, but it's not a clean 
you know situation you're shooting through things and that's why that long lens can be really handy yeah oh, i can look it, at that photograph all day and those blue eyes oh my gosh yeah really handsome yeah that is particularly good angle on him and, and this is the other thing to think to remember is that the minutest little change of angle i learned this a long time ago with shooting the gallery stills as well is you know they're just the littlest angle of change of angle on your head can make a world of difference the two frames either side of this no good yeah it's about finding it isn't it and um, yeah absolutely stunning oh, they see there's your action with yeah, 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 yeah. everything it's all going on there oh <laughs> uh, yeah i like a bit of i like a bit of blur a bit of movement you know a bit of a pan a whip pan yeah it was dark as well. That was the other challenge on Bond, on the whole of Bond, unless we were outside, you know, that it was dark. That that yeah. was a thing I constantly had to, you know, every film's got their challenge, whether it's technical challenge or um, or murder, you know, there was all the people and not many much space, you know, every film's got its own thing, hasn't it? And yeah. yeah, so it was it was just finding ways to work within the very moody, wonderful moody lighting and still making we've got a we've got a freezer frame ideally and we've got to get good exposure and all those things. So so yeah, again this was one of those things where, you know, he did it a couple of times and I just decided to go with the blur, you know, and just just find that right combination of um, shutter speed and aperture and, um, you know, just go with the blur and, yeah, and hope for the best. Some, sometimes that's all you do. You don't know if it's going to work every time. And uh -huh. you're often quite quite relieved when they say, right, let's go again. And you're like, yes, um, I get another chance at it. And, yeah, I was thrilled when this became uh, a poster. Um, and, you know, they took the back, slot of the background and I was really pleased about that. And you got the watch in too, so they'd be stoked with that. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Send you one? <laughs> Not yet. Funnily enough, no. I had um, the last one on Spectre. Um, Aston sent me a really cool jacket, which was which I was stoked about. Oh, nice. This a oh, great shot. Lashana. Is that a set or is it a practical location? That's a set. Yeah, that's on like oh. that's in uh, in Pinewood. Yeah, and she was just hanging around and, you know, having a chat and I just saw this moment where, you know, I saw the possibility of getting her because she was just off frame, you know, it was only a couple of steps she had to do. I got maybe four or five frames, you know, I'm really quick. I never push it too much. I'm, I'm always know, try to know exactly what I want. I get my, make sure I've got exposure right beforehand before I even say, you know, I'd love to get the shot of you, whatever you say. So, you know, you try and be be fast, work fast on your feet. Yeah. And um, the wonderful thing about working with actors is they know their characters the, well and they <laughs> can step in and just do what they do. And if, as long as you've got all your side of things sorted, you know, that's that's what happens. That's a good point. She's so cool too. What an extraordinary She is set. so cool. She is just fantastic. I think she brings a, a really another level of cool to Bond for sure. Yeah, cool. Ah, uh, see more of your character posters. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was fun shooting them. We had uh, we did about three days, not consecutive, so we had to sort of come and go with all the the kit and the lights and the backdrops. But it was it was good fun, and the actors were all really into it and really happy to to you know try whatever they needed to try. So yeah, it was great. No, great stuff. I know. Now, hold on. Are you allowed to tell the story to this one? Because this is my favourite Bond photograph ever in the history of the James oh. Bond films. And I've watched 24 of them and um, and I've worked on three of them, three of the 25, and I have to say this has just got everything going on. It's got the... Oh. It's, it's got the... the um, the coupe or the vantage in the background, it's got the watch, it's got Bond style, it's got the glasses, it screams London, you've even got a little British flag in the background, there's a taxi, it's just like, thank you very much, um, classic. Phew, that's, yeah, well, thank you, thank you for saying that, that that's a huge um, high bar and 
it's strange to see one shot of the many thousands that you take sort of um, break through and um, yeah it was it was a really great day we were out filming in Hammersmith in the morning by the river and then and then a, a, a quick um, shot where he drives in gets out of his vehicle parks up gets out and walks across the street they had a crane coming in following the car as it came in and um, following him he gets out and walks so it's all one sort of swift lovely movement and I had to sort of stay out of frame and meet the camera as it came through to get a few frames as he exited the car and walked towards me and passed yeah and I had to I had to be again aware of everything that was around me so I can't always be sort of stationary happily looking through your camera and perfect perfectly sort of get you know it's often kind of a it's a bit like a dance isn't it and you're working in around everything else that's going on and the great thing is once you've done the scene a few times you you the choreography of that dance you can refine it and refine it and refine it and what was what was great about that day is that um you know he walked past the camera and he could have stopped there once he exited their frame he could have stopped but being the consummate professional that he is, he could see what I was trying to do. And he just walked those four or five steps more. Oh. Just every time. He didn't say anything to me. I didn't say anything to him. But, it, we, it, you know, that's what he did. And, and I worked my butt off to make sure that I um, represented what he was doing, you know, um, to make sure I got that shot. And I shot, you know, as much as I could and that because I knew it was working and I knew we could get something and what was it was such a such a treat to get that shot and I was so relieved as well because we were still waiting to get the ultimate shot of Bond as a first release picture and yeah it's it's always you can sort of settle in once you've got that shot and it's out and you know the producers are happy and Daniel's happy and the director's happy and they you know it's it's kind of milestone to get that first first look picture out the door oh it's perfect the the hands the, the foot in the position the shadow on the ground it's just honestly it's if there's this is probably if there was one photograph that i wish that i'd ever taken it would probably uh, be this one so well done oh, mate. thank that's, you that's thank you so very good. much well again you know mother nature helped out there you know that's that that shadow on his foot that's the sun that's not light that they've set up so now, is it the sun down there or is it the sun reflecting off a window on the it building? It might be the sun reflecting off a window, perfectly reflecting off a window. Yeah. That, that could be that as well. Um, but, it, yeah, I mean, I wasn't even looking at wherever it was coming from because you're concentrating on making sure all your the tech stuff is going to be right. That's amazing. It was a good hey, day. Um, do you want to uh, fill us in a little bit about the format of your uh, Stills Academy? Yeah, so uh, the first course that we're running is a free course. It's a four-day free course, uh, just an hour each day, and it's delivered live on Instagram. And so we'll run through, um, you know, what makes a good film still, why a film still is important, the kind of gear you might need, and a few little tips on how to get started. And there'll be a few little... Um, homeworky things to do just to start thinking about things like a stills photographer um and so if you're interested in that then you can register you can just follow a link in my bio on uh nicola dove photo or you can go straight to filmstillsacademy.com and you can register there it's four days it's free um and then after that i'll be running a four week long um course you know for those people that really want to go for it and really want to dive deep into breaking down scene by scene what your options are, you know, diagrams. Um, we've got some guest speakers, one of whom is going to be Jason Boland, which I'm so excited about. He'll be <laughs> sharing some of his wisdom, so that's going to be awesome. And I've got Claudia Kalindian, who's the publicist, who was on Publicist on Bond and on um, a lot of the Batmans and, you know, if there's nothing 
she doesn't know about film, it's not worth knowing. So mm-hmm. that's going to be exciting. And I'm, I'm hoping to get a producer on board as well so that they can talk to, you know, talk to people about what it is from the producer's side, what they're looking for, for in their, you know, requirements for photographers. So, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm just, I'm really looking forward to sharing the work, the knowledge that you build up without really even knowing that you are over the course of these years. So yeah, yeah I'm excited and I hope lots of people can join me. Well, I usually say there's no shortcuts, but this actually might be a bit of a shortcut. <laughs> so, um, well done on that. I think it's I think it's uh, good for the good for the soul to share. And um, at the end of the day, you can tell people a million times of how things should be done, but if they don't listen, uh, then it's just not going to happen. So I think it's I think it's a really great idea that you've got coming up. And with the four week one, is it yeah. every day? And how long? No, so for four weeks, we'll have two sessions per week. So there's eight modules, but they'll be, you know, chunky chunky modules, two hours each. And, you know, we'll really get to, and also get to work as a smaller group and um, share pictures. And I'm really hoping to work with those photographers to develop their portfolio so that even if they haven't been on set yet, we can still work together to get together a portfolio that's a film sales appropriate portfolio that they could go and show a producer or go and show a short film. Um, and so we'll be working together on, you know, these elements like storytelling in a picture, um, you know, portrait, portraiture and character work. So really breaking and, and, you know, that's about editing again as well. So hopefully they'll get out, I'll set them some assignments to go out and shoot so that they can work towards having a, a a film stills appropriate portfolio. Can I come on one of the days when yeah. you're going through the photos? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, I love that part. It's like being a Nikon ambassador and that we get to judge yeah. you know, competitions and with the Society of Motion Pictures still photographers doing draft week and you know, I just love looking fun. at people's photos. It was fun, right? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it's always a privilege, isn't it, to look at people's work and, and talk to them about what goes on for them you know, behind the scenes and what their thought processes were. And, yeah, it's it's great. Wow. Hey, mate, I've got to say thank you so much for um, for joining me today and us today, my little team. Thank and, you. And um, it was so, so, so much good information and glorious photographs. Oh, thank you um, very much. I'm, I'm really proud to call you my friend so you know well absolutely, cool. absolutely likewise and again i'm just so thankful we got that chance to cross over because you know we just stills photographers never really meet each other we always cross in the night you know so it was a real treat yep 100 percent. yeah right. cool well i'm going to let Thanks you get so back, to, back to your kids and and, yeah. and, your, and your vw camper <laughs> oh yeah we're heading off in the south island in the new year so Oh, Can't wait. That'll be rad. Okay. All right, mate. Nice take one. care. All right. Take care, Jason. Bye. Well, team, there you go. Nicola Dove. What an extraordinary story she's got and um, good heart. And you guys, make sure if you're interested, you should hook in and do her course because you're going to learn a lot. Um, so much fun. Had a great chat. And uh, if you could, subscribe, do the bell so you get notified, and comments down below. All right. Have a great day. Cheers.